So if you saw the last video with some time-saving tricks in Premiere, I actually have been using After Effects for even longer than I've been using Premiere. So I definitely felt like I had some time-saving tricks to share in there as well. So that's what I'm gonna do in this video. Now, I wanna reiterate that uh, as with the last video, this one is also going to be sort of tips and tricks that are not like mind-blowing full techniques. They're just like little tiny little things that have saved me lots of time. So this first one is not really actually a tip. It's more of a thing that you should download and start using because it's amazing and it saves lots of time. Uh, so there's this free thing called Animation Composer. I've never actually used uh, the animation composer thing. It's kind of like a stock uh, little animation tool thing, but when you download it, it comes with these three uh, things that are incredible and they save so much time. Anchor point mover, transition shifter, and keyframe wingman. And, and I like to just keep them all right next to each other uh, on my interface here. And these things uh, have, I, I, they probably shaved about a year off of the time that I spend doing things in After Effects over the last, you know, 12 years or so. Um, so, Anchor Point Mover, super handy little tool. You click on it and it moves the anchor point and it just does it in one click. Usually I'm just clicking in the center, so with things like circles, it really makes it easy to, you know, scale things uh, in nice ways, but, it, you know, if you want to, you can you can scale from this side and uh, you know, all the things that a an anchor point being moved can do, uh, but you just have it in this one little click. I used to kind of have to right click, go to transform, center anchor point and layer content. So obviously that's much faster. Then we have keyframe wingman, which is probably my most used one. So um, it's just a really quick way to add a bit of an eased curve to your keyframe. So uh, I'm gonna put one here, I'm gonna put one here. And on this one, let's just move it over here, so if you're familiar with uh, curves at all, now this is just going to be a really sudden uh, stop. It's not gonna be smooth at all on the keyframes. So this guy is how we will address that. So you select your keyframe and bop, you just drag it, you select it, drag it, and now we have a nice little smooth animation. So if you decide, hey, I don't want that to be that smooth, bip, boom. Now we're back to a linearized keyframe and it's really nice and fast. So let's say we have um, a whole bunch of these going at once. So we'll have, let's say the, all these, and um, we want them to do different things at different times. Um, that's when this other one comes in, which is called Transition Shifter. And this is also really fun and really amazing. So we have all these uh, circles now and they're going to do that slow animation. Let's go ahead and ease it real quick. And uh, yeah, so this thing has some really cool stuff. So you can uh, basically stagger layers by however many frames. So, and then you just hit this do button. So right now it's going in ascending order. So it's gonna go from bottom to top. You go boom. And now it's shifted all my layers by one frame. You can just keep hitting it and it'll shift them out. And so it just saves you from having to like eyeball it and it just shifts things by a frame. You can stagger layers, you can stagger your in transitions, out tra transitions. Um, and there's, you know, these other little shifts and aligns and things like that. Um, and so now when we do this animation, you know, it'll just be a nice quick little thing. So having these three uh, things kind of grouped right here has saved me so much time. All right, and this next thing is like something that I sort of call like the two keyframe method. Uh, and it's really small, but it has saved me lots of time. So the general idea of this is that I always start with an object in its uh, sort of intended final resting place. And then you can make the changes later on. So like, let's say this square right here, I want it to end this size and in this part of the frame. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and even with, without moving my playhead, I'll just make three keyframes and I'll just shift them over. And then now I can make my changes, okay? And so it's it's literally that simple. It's it's making your keyframes starting with the end position and then and then you know just dragging them out, give yourself a little room and make your uh, changes there. And that's in contrast to like starting 
in a different look and then animating it into something. It's like you want to start the way that you want it to end up. And then it's a lot easier to sort of, you know, visualize how you'd want it to get there. So boom, yeah, two keyframe method. <laughs> like I said, it's a quick one. All right, and so this next one is replacing with the Alt key. Now, a lot of you might know this, but I think it's probably the most common thing that I see new After Effects users not doing. Um, and it's like such a time saver. And so I just always try to make sure that I tell as many people about it as I can. So we have this random little scene here and I've got this footage of, uh, you know, some cool clouds moving around, um, nothing too crazy, but I've put some effects on it. I've got, you know, a tent effect and it has a track mat of this shape layer here. Um, you know, so it's, it's just got a few little steps involved and let's say we want to change out the footage or we want to cut to some other footage, but we don't want to go through the process of setting everything up again. Um, it's really easy and super fast and all you got to do is you select your footage down here in the comp and then you go up to your bin, select your new footage that you want to replace it with, hold down the alt key just like that and just drag it down and let go. And so now some new footage has been put in, but it's basically just taken on all of the various parameters and effects and everything that we set up uh, for the first footage. So it just saves you time. Like imagine if every time you wanted to bring in a new clip, you like duplicated it and reset everything up again, um, or copied and pasted all the effects, you know, just little things that save you a lot of clicks. All right, and then the next one is kind of a similar one, but it's about using and being comfortable with the bracket keys. So one thing that's really frustrating in After Effects is like sort of editing, especially if you come from an editing background. And uh, that's because the the there's not really that many good tools for it in After Effects and things get a little bit messy. If you hit one of the bracket keys, so right now I'm gonna do left bracket, it's going to shift the entire layer over. It's not going to make a cut. It's going to shift the whole layer, but it's going to shift it to wherever you have your playhead, okay? So right now I'm using the left bracket key and you see how it's just kind of shifting. Um, and this is still the beginning of the footage here and you can tell by that little black corner. Now, if I was to alternatively hit Alt and then one of the bracket keys, let's see what, what we do now. So Alt and then I'll do right bracket. So now what it's done, it's not shifting the clip, but it's cutting the clip. It's basically bringing the end of the footage down to here. Okay. So that is a, basically the difference there. So if you, you know, you just get really comfortable using alt or just hitting the bracket key there. And uh, another way that you can do it, say if you have a layer and you just want to split it, you don't want to necessarily cut it or move it, but you want to split it in half. Uh, that one is control shift D. And so now we've cut the clip and made a, a new clip and a new layer. Okay, and this one kind of dives into one of the common pitfalls of animating in After Effects, and that's making sure you do your keyframing always at the beginning of a layer. So let me explain what I'm talking about. So we've got these five circles here, and let's say we want each one of them to do something like one at a time, okay? Um, so we're gonna do, uh, on this first layer, I'm gonna do a little position keyframing here. We'll go So let's say we want all of these circles to do that same thing, right? Um, so you might be tempted to do this. You might be tempted to now that this one's done, we're going to go into this layer and then we're going to do this animation the same way that we did the first one, right? But we're just going to do it uh, at this point in the layer where we want that to happen, which, you know, that does seem to make sense, right? Well, not in my opinion. To me, you always want to do that animation at the beginning of that layer. Let's say we're looking at our timeline like this, where all, all of it's collapsed, we don't see the keyframes. You can't visually tell where the keyframes are if you're making your animations later on down in the layer. But if you do it the way that I suggested, where all of your keyframes are at the beginning, you know exactly where they are. They're at the start of the layer, okay? So if you have all of your keyframes collapse and you have these dragged around, you can still visually tell where your animation is going to be happening if you do it this way. And it just keeps everything a lot cleaner to me. Now I'll show you a little trick for making really quick masks and shape layers. So this one is also really quick and simple, but it just saves you a few clicks to me. Um, so 
one thing that I like a lot is doing borders and stuff. And, and, you know, usually I do a lot with solids. So one thing that is really nice is like, let's say you have a solid and you want to mask it out of the whole frame. So if you have your solid selected and you go up to this uh, rectangle tool, if you just double click on that, it's going to make a mask that fits the uh, comp size perfectly. And so now if you want to, you could go he down here to your mask settings, you could change it to subtract. And uh, we just got some footage back there. And if we hit double tap the M key and uh, bring in the mask expansion, now we've got a handy dandy little little border tool there. And the, uh, the same thing works for shape layers as well. If you don't have anything selected and you just want to make a shape layer that covers the entire frame, just double click. We've got a perfect rectangle the size of our comp. And if we wanted to, we could also turn off the fill and have a, uh, you know, a shape layer border instead. All right, and now, now for a tip about how to create and manage longer form motion graphics pieces. And this is actually partly a Premiere tip, but I think it's uh, you know just as relevant for After Effects. So one thing that After Effects users know is that dealing with audio is kind of a pain, and then dealing with uh, kind of longer pieces, it can get a little bit confusing to sort of know uh, where things are at and, and you know just organization gets a little bit difficult. And so my first step when I make a trailer is I basically I have my music picked out and I make these little placeholder slates uh, for each section of the video. So let's pretend we're making a trailer for this tutorial, for instance. Um, instead of doing it all in After Effects and just having a bunch of pre-comps and just things kind of floating around, what I like to do is I like to lay everything out in Premiere first. Um, and I do, the, I do that with these uh, just little crappy looking placeholder slates. I don't put any thought into the way they look. But it helps me get a sense of the timing. So you see how you know, I'm down to you. And we put the B-roll there, maybe. And we can just cut up the audio and make everything match up a little bit better. And then, um, as I'm sure you you know, uh, there's a handy little tool called Dynamic the Link Comps. So we can right-click on these text layers and say replace with After Effects composition. And so what it's going to do is it's going to bring in a linked comp and I make a folder, I'll call this like shot one, and I'll bring all the stuff involved with that into that folder. And so now we have this composition, it's the linked comp. Everything we do in here is going to show up in Premiere. And so, yeah, it's, you know, you probably already knew about dynamic link comps, but this workflow of kind of framing in a video into Premiere and then sending it to After Effects to do all your designy stuff, like, you know, we'll bring in that random skyline footage here and we save it. And now when we go here, it's in Premiere. And to go one step further into talking about Premiere in an After Effects tutorial land, um, there's another thing in Premiere that makes that last process a lot easier. So one thing you'll, you'll notice when you start having a whole bunch of linked comps is that the timeline starts acting very, very slow. You get a lot of weird glitchy type things and uh, it can take a while to try to actually watch back your footage in real time. So say this was chugging up our system way too much and we needed to do something about it. You could right click and say render and replace. And in here, you can, uh, you know, import a uh, e export preset, or you can use one of these stock ones. You can just go QuickTime if you want. And if you need to have um, alpha, you'll you'll need to make a separate uh, encoding preset for that. I've made this one here. It's ProRes 4444 alpha. And you can just say save this next to original media. And what it's going to do is it's going to render out just a video file version of that graphic. And so, yeah, we'll just say next to original media and I'll hit okay. And boom, now this is just a video clip and it's going to play back real time. So say you then want to make a change again, you can right click and go and say restore unrendered. And now we're back to our linked comp with After Effects. Everyone's happy. Now the same thing also works with Mogurt files. So if you ever use Mogurt files, you know they kind of tend to run pretty slow on the timeline. You can do the exact same thing with your Mogurt files. All right, let's talk about a couple of time-saving tips for motion tracking. So 
So we have this shot here and we just, uh, let's say we want to add in some text or something like that. One thing that I like to do first and foremost, anytime I'm doing any sort of tracking is I like to take my footage and pre-compose it. We're going to say pre-compose and we're going to say, um, move all attributes into new composition. And so now we have a clean little five second chunk. But the reason I like to do things this way is now I have this thing that I can add uh, effects to in the pre-composed version of it and make the tracking a little bit easier. So we can go to effect. And one thing that I tend to like to use is unsharp mask. And that'll help. Uh, we well, Usually what I do is I turn it way down to like 15 and then I do another copy. I do one at like 25 and then maybe another one at like 40 or something. And yeah, that's way too much unsharp mask, but it's going to give the tracker a little bit of an easier time. Another thing you can do is add in some extra contrast. So I'll go to color correction, curves, and I will just crunch this up a bit. And really what you want to do is you want to give the tracker as much as it can uh, work with to make a good track. So we've got it sharpened a little bit. I'm gonna drag these curves up to the top actually. So now we've got a really nice sharpened image uh, and it's going to have a lot of extra contrast. Now we go and do our tracking and then all we gotta do is just clear these out and our track will stay the same. But you know, we have the ability to sort of uh, just keep things clean and have a nice place to do uh, some augmentation to make our track a little bit easier. And now uh, we'll put that to good use and I'll show you some, some tricks to make your tracking a lot better and to kind of be able to customize how the tracker works. So now that we have our crazy looking contrasty image, we can select, we'll go to track motion and uh, I always do position rotation um, at least and then sometimes scale but we'll just leave it at position and rotation for now and let's find a couple nice contrasty points to uh, track real quick so these leaves definitely have to be uh, good enough I think so we'll grab that and let's grab this leaf over here as well so uh, let's go ahead and track so one thing that I always do when I'm doing planar tracking and After Effects is I open up the op options tab here and there's some really useful options in here. You can actually track by color or saturation. So here we have quite a bit of both, but um, it would be jumping around a lot because it is a ton of green. One thing that I really uh, like to change because adapt feature is when you get those tracks where the tracker point just goes all over the screen and everything. And you're like, what are you even looking at? Well, it's trying to adapt the feature that it's looking for. Um, if, if basically if the confidence is below 80, so, um, 80% is definitely kind of low in my opinion, or what I like to do is you can say, stop tracking. Um, and I really like that because I don't want the tracker tracking the wrong thing. I don't want it to think too much on its own and you can set this to like 90. So what that means is, uh, if the confidence is below 90, like if the tracker is like, I'm only 90% sure that, uh, I'm, I'm looking at what you want me to be looking at, it will stop tracking instead of adapt feature, which is where it'll start trying to guess at what you're trying to track. And that's when your tracker just goes all over the place. So if you say stop tracking, if confidence is below 90 um, and let's go really high, we'll do We'll do, go up to 95. So now it's, it's going to need to be reasonably sure that it's tracking the right thing. And so I've hit and it, see it's already stopped because uh, you know, it's it's not sure. And there, there it only went two frames. But we can zoom in and be like, no, okay, you're good. You're still looking at the leaf. So see, it's kind of crazy. Like when you start doing things this way, you, you start to like really notice how often the computer is, is kind of guessing at stuff. So it's a really good way to just quickly get better tracks. So yeah, one thing I'm always really fascinated about is sort of seeing how other people tend to find little creative ways to save time in whatever software they're using all the time. And so yeah, these are some of mine. I hope at least some of them were helpful for you and uh, maybe save you some time in your work as well. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and I'll see all of you next time.